And for the Lord Jesus, a wonderful round of applause. Every time we gather together in the name of the Lord Jesus, He is here with us all. That's what He promised. Sometimes people are so disconnected that they just won't believe or they fail to pay attention, and they end up missing that great moment when they are able to meet the Lord Jesus. Jesus, He also uses us for preaching, He uses us as well for prayers, and He also uses us to understand the Word, which is everything we actually need. The moment that the Word is shown to us and we understand it, my brethren, at that moment, we all then have the capacity that the Lord Jesus would have had had He been there to do the same works that He did at the time. Everything depends on our understanding of the Word. Therefore, uh, uh, shall we, let's open our Bibles to Deuteronomy 26, verse 8, because I'm in the middle of this series here. And unless I hurry up a bit, I'm not going to get it finished. I always like to talk about one specific subject per week. And we've been discussing verses 1 and 2. We also talked about verse number 7. And this is a rather important message here in Deuteronomy 26. And it shall be when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, and you possess it and dwell in it, that you shall take some of the first of all the produce of the ground, which you shall bring from your land that the Lord your God is giving you, and put it in a basket, and go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. That was, that was like a statute for Israel, but it's also a statute for us. They didn't have to do a single thing to inherit that land, but quite the opposite. God wanted to give them that land. God removed them from Egypt and took them to that land and gave it to them. And God told them that when they entered the land, they should take some of the first of all the produce of the ground and put it in a basket and go to the place and bring it before the Lord God. Now verse number three is as follows. Let's read. And you shall go to the one who is priest in those days and say to him, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come to the country which the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. And so they entered the land and they possessed uh, the land and dwelled in it. The land was fruitful. They picked the produce, brought it to the Lord God and made a declaration to him. Today I have come to the country. And this is what this really means. We hear the gospel. We come to the house of the Lord God. And we all know that the gospel is the true land of promise. When we begin to receive our blessings, we should come before the Lord and give our testimony to Him. And we must declare it, God, from this day forward, I have come to this land, I possess it, and I shall dwell in it. Your holy word shall be able to guide me, and I shall follow you from this moment on and I'm going to use the power that you have given me. I talked about this during our last meeting. I shall discuss something new later. Now going back to the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 26, in the last meeting we talked about verse number seven. Then we cried out to the Lord God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. So they cried out to the Lord. What does that mean? It's the cry of the warrior when they go out to battle. And the battles in the, in, in the past were fought man versus man using bows and spears and shields. They left for battle crying out and absolutely sure that they were going to win. Similarly, we need to fight our spiritual battles crying out to our Lord God. I need help. I need power. I shall defeat this evil. My brethren, only in this way can you completely change your lives forever. Shall we read what else they did when they cried out to God? Then we cried out to the Lord God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice. That is, the Lord was ready to help them and rescue them, and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. The Lord God will most certainly look on your lack of power and your lack of capability, and God will work in you so that you can become a great blessing indeed. Amen? So now we're moving on to verse number 8, brethren. We've already studied verse 7. When they cried out to the Lord God, they were like warriors heading out to the battlefield, and God then heard all of their voices. Last meeting, I explained that the voice must be wrapped around the word, and I'm not going to repeat that again because we're going to discuss something new today. Let's move on and start discussing some new topics. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. My brethren, this is the first lesson for us. The Lord is the one who must be praised. 
for his blessings. Let's say that he uses me one of these days to deliver you a message. He uses me to say a prayer and you receive a blessing. Wow, Dr. Suarez can be really powerful when he is interceding. No, no, no. It's God who really is powerful when he's answering prayers. You cannot take away from God the glory that he deserves. Man is completely meaningless. There's no such thing as, but Paul, the apostle, did this. No, no, and Moses, no one's talking about Moses here. They were all very clear here, my brethren. Shall we read this passage again? So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. The greatest mistake is praising a servant rather than giving credit to God. God expects that whoever is being held captive must follow his plans. Let me try to clarify this. God made them free. But how did God do that? Well, one of them just stood up and said, let's leave now. They would have been destroyed. Never let anyone stand up and just tell you what to do. God shall give you guidance through his holy word. God worked and guided Moses, who had been away from Egypt for 40 years, because they were trying to capture Moses because he tried to defend a Hebrew who was being beaten by an Egyptian. But Moses hit him so hard he killed the Egyptian instantly. He just fell to the ground and died. And Moses had to flee then. And God reached out to Moses and prepared him. Moses went to speak to Pharaoh ten times. And God sent out ten plagues. But Pharaoh wouldn't let the people go. And God sent out the plagues. God knows how to do things. When Moses brought the people out of there, Moses was hesitant because God had told him, tell the people to go forward. But to where? There were mountains everywhere. The Red Sea was ahead of them. The Pharaoh and his armies were behind them. So go forward into the sea. So Moses lifted up his rod and stretched it out over the sea, and there was this very strong east wind from the east to the west, and it was windy all night long, and the waters of the sea were divided. The sea went back. There was a wall between the waters, and the people couldn't feel a single drop of water. The wind held everything back. That's some strong wind. No one had ever seen that. And that's some polite wind. And I'll tell you why. It came from the east to the west. It moved east to west. That wind that divided the Red Sea touched three million people, and not one of them fell down. It was strong, but only for the sea. This proves God's power doesn't bring any problems to us whatsoever. In a spiritual battle, you don't have to believe, and who does shall suffer, that you will lose a single strand of hair. You won't. But Dr. Suarez, the pastor told me already, whenever I start to consecrate myself, problems start to appear in my household. My wife gets sick. My son is run over by a car. This means everything is wrong at his household. The devil is the boss there. The devil growls and you obey. When you accept the Lord Jesus, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. That's it. You just need him. Everybody will be protected. There's no such thing as the devil becoming angry. The devil can become angry. It doesn't matter. You can provoke him as much as you want because he will never be able to touch you because Jesus said, therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And that's it. The most important thing in the world is preaching the gospel. The person can be an idolater or a sorcerer. They work with the worst kind of devil there is, but they hear the gospel and accept Jesus. They come over to this side here there's a gulf here that can't be crossed. Abraham said that, um, not to a Lazarus, but he said to that rich man that he couldn't pass because there was a gulf. No one could pass from one side to the other. And that's just impossible. But if a person believes that that can happen, what can they do then? Let's say the gulf is here. If they stretch out their strong arms, the enemy will use their arms as a bridge. You shouldn't stretch out your strong arms for the enemy. You shall not confess something that is not true. Everything that is not written in the Bible is a lie and absolutely unreasonable. Therefore, God is the one who brought them out of Egypt. And what happened next? God did give them their deliverance, but he expected them to follow his plans. And they did follow them. My brethren, unless we do that, unless we follow what God commands, there shall be no deliverance. It's necessary that we understand that we have to humble ourselves before the mighty hand of the Lord. And where is this written? In the book of Peter. Peter wrote this. It's in 1 Peter 5, verse number 6. As we talk to God, we can't think something like, but I know how to address the Lord. You don't. You need to humble yourself. You know nothing. You can't see beyond the end of your nose. Let's face it. No matter how educated and cultured you may be, Shall we read what the word says from 1 Peter 5, verse 6? 
Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. You have to come to the world of God not to become a teacher, but to be a student at the school of the Holy Spirit. Humble yourself, learn your lesson, follow the plans God has been revealing to you, which he has been telling you through his word, and start working on them. We are a group of people who live separated from one another, but we're all very united. God has been feeding us all the same way. Here you will see major business people along with very humble employees. You shall find doctors here and students and teachers and their housewives and retirees. But we have all been created by the Lord God and we all need to be before the Lord. God makes plans for us and we must follow his plans. They followed and were successful. The Bible says, So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. In the Bible, Egypt actually means sin. And that's where God is bringing us out of. In sin, the devil manipulates us with his sagacity, with his powers and his empty deceit. There's not a single person who hasn't met the Lord Jesus and who is not being used by the devil. They can be someone who has moral values. Perhaps they won't tolerate wrong actions, immoral things, but they will end up tolerating other things. The devil is very wise. He will not waste his time with that person. If he notices that the person lights something, the devil will try to lure them. He will set a trap just like for a bird, choo-choo, and the person will fall into the trap. You need to let that go, brethren. Sin is no good, and that's it. And sin can completely destroy you. And you should all know that unless we open our eyes, we shall never escape from the evil hands of the Pharaoh. Well, on our own, brethren, we shall never escape. I will bring the people out of that land. So please may a leader volunteer among you. That will never work. Let God guide you. Let God be in charge of your deliverance. Let God prepare your heart for the revelations as he is doing right now. In Egypt, in Egypt, you will find the ruling class. But this ruling class is also being dominated, for they are all slaves. There's absolutely no one who's living in sin who can say, I'm free. That's a lie. I'm making a lot of money. Then they will have to spend a lot of money with treatments. I'm doing that. They will have many problems later. There's absolutely no one who's on the other side who is over there on the evil side who hasn't been saved by Jesus who can fully say that they're fulfilled. They could be famous. They could be major authorities. They can be a person who is a, a great athlete or a champion, but they are frustrated and they absolutely need God's power in their lives. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm. Brethren, one can only leave a life of sin behind them with the help of God's almighty hand. It's necessary for God to work, and that's not something easy. Those of us who have left Egypt don't seem to realize how hard God had to work, how long he had to fight. And this is reality. Whoever has experienced salvation knows, God has brought me out. I'm not in the hands of the devil. And when temptation comes their way, I don't want anything to do with you. I don't want you. I am now a child of the Lord God. Those who have been delivered from sin prove they really love the Lord Jesus. What do you mean by that, Dr. Suarez? Luke 7. If you have been delivered, you have to prove you love the Lord Jesus. Luke chapter 7. Verse number 37. Here you will find the story of that sinful woman who anointed the feet of the Lord Jesus with oil. She came to the house of Simon, for Jesus was invited to come in. She came in behind him and started to weep. And she began to wash Jesus' feet and wipe them with her hair. And Jesus said something to Simon. And Simon looked at that sinful woman kissing the feet of the Lord Jesus a woman who is an adulterer, a wrongdoer, someone whose life is, is shameful. That's the translation they gave it. The words they used per woman, she was a prostitute. And she entered the house, truly repented, and began to weep and to kiss the feet of Jesus. She washed them with her tears and wiped his feet with her hair. And Simon was kind of apprehensive when he saw that. My goodness, that man is not a man of God. And if he were, he would know what kind of a woman that was. How could he allow a woman of such bad reputation and honor come and kiss his feet and wipe them with her hair? Uh, 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 that's not right. <laughs> there must be something wrong. And the Lord Jesus, who was fully aware of all those things, said, Well, let's begin with verse 37. 
And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is and who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, Jesus has the power to hear even what your heart whispers, brethren. <laughs> Be careful, for he knows everything. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. Did you hear that? That's some witty Pharisee. <laughs> there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. That's, so that's 10 times less. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love me more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. At that time, people would get their feet dirty because the roads were all of dirt, very dirty and dusty. But she washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss. That is, you didn't give me a kiss on the cheek. But this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Brethren, the moment we stop to think about the things that God did so that we could live our lives with Jesus in the land of promise where we can and where we should be comforted for all of our tribulations completely and being victorious, we shall love the Lord Jesus. Only God could have done this. And with patience and love. How long has God been chasing you, to put it that way, drawing you with gentle cords so that you could come to the gospel? and you didn't want to come, and you said stupid things, and you didn't want it, and you sinned, and sinned some more, and God came and brought you right here. You really need to love the Lord Jesus deeply. And the more you love him, the more he will love you back. So the Lord brought us out with a mighty hand, and God has also worked very hard as to deliver every slave who was being held captive by sin with an outstretched arm. So in addition to his mighty hand, God has an outstretched arm to bring those people out. This shows how valuable our lives are to the Lord God. And why would he value us if we're unworthy? Of course we're valuable, but not by ourselves. We are beings that are eternal, and we're all part of the Lord God. God doesn't want to have his part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, but he will do it unless you truly repent. And that's why God works so hard. He brought us out with a mighty hand using all his strength and with an outstretched arm. God is taking us away from the hands of the enemy. And everything we need to do is believe in him. And there's more for us here. With great terror and with signs and wonders, the devil was incredibly amazed. He was really surprised. When he saw Jesus entering hell away from the Lord God, and the devil was clapping his hands, saying, He's here with us now. But Jesus began to deliver us then. And Jesus started to fight with the devil, but it's not like he punched the devil here and there. It wasn't like that. He took away from the devil all the capacity he had to make every one of us suffer, and he took it all out. It was a great fight. Jesus took everything away and started to suffer and suffer and suffer and suffer, and the devil started to feel powerless. Nowadays, the devil is the loser. He's completely powerless. The devil won't touch you unless you let him. In the name of Jesus, when you proclaim this, the devil who has been frightened once becomes desperate. He cannot resist. My brethren, the devil is never able to resist you when you follow the word of God and use the name of the Lord Jesus. You are comforted in all your tribulation, and nothing shall ever disturb you. And what else is written in the Bible for us? The work is far greater than we can possibly understand. 
and that work that caused great terror in the devil, and with signs and wonders, brethren. Now let's open our Bibles and move to John chapter 6, verse 44, and then we'll read verse 65. This is a very important passage as well, and it has everything to do with what I've been talking about all this week. Jesus said, the work is far greater than we could possibly understand. This work is personal. It's by the Lord, with great terror and with signs and wonders. No one can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. God did that. You had a little faith. You grew, and God took you, and he is drawing you back to Jesus. Don't let the Lord God down. Don't turn your back to the Lord God and run towards hell once again. No, no, no. You're a child of God now, and no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. It's God who's drawing you to the Lord Jesus. God wants you to be with Christ. God wants you to be fulfilled. Shall we read verse 65 now? It reads as follows. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. Be glad, because you are here, brethren. God granted you to come here to Jesus. No one can stop you. But Dr. Suarez, there's this devil who's the big boss. Stop right there. There's no devil who's a big boss. The devil's a loser. There's only one boss, and that's Jesus, the Lord of the heavens and earth. The devil is stopping me. That's because you're allowing him to do that. You're the kind of person who's scared to death when people growl at you. You shouldn't be afraid of big dogs, as a matter of fact, when they growl at you. You can make them quiet with the right techniques. Using the name of the Lord Jesus, you can cast out any demon. No one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. God granted that to you, and you can become a child of Jesus. Now let's go to the real-life drama for today. You see, I've suffered from this condition for over 20 years. But in my daily life, I could barely walk because my steps seemed shorter every time I took a step. I couldn't move. You see, she she could barely move. She couldn't do anything, you know. She, she was very stiff all the time, you know. And everything she would do in that case would give her backaches. She couldn't bend down. She couldn't stand turning around. She could do very little things, you know, because of her back. It was very difficult for me to lie down because I couldn't lie on either side or lie on my back with my face up. I could only lie on my chest because whenever I touched any single bit where there was a bone in my back, then everything would hurt, then everything hurt, just everything. I went to the doctor and he said, well, Maria, you're going to need surgery for that. Your condition sounds very serious. You're going to need an MRI. I had lots of tests, and they all said the same thing. I needed surgery, but I didn't want that. I said, I'm not going to have the surgery, doctor, because there are people who have the same problem as I do, and they had the surgery, and they were not successful. He said I had a bone spur as well as a herniated disc. On May the 2nd, 2014, Dr. Suarez was in Osasco. He interceded for the afflicted, and Maria das Graças was healed because of her faith in the Lord Jesus. Dr. Suarez was preaching, and I paid close attention to his preaching, right? And Dr. Suarez said, now come here in front of the altar. I didn't think twice and went there. When I got there, he said, now do everything you couldn't do before you got healed. I was the first one, you know. I bent down, I ran, I did everything I couldn't do before. I had a very serious back problem. If anything would fall on the floor, I couldn't bend down to get it. You couldn't bend down? No, no way. My shoe just came off. Can you pick it up for me, please? I certainly can do you it can now. You can do it now? Oh, praise the Lord. Go now, sister, in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. And that's when I knew I was really healed. And 
after all that was over, she can do everything at home completely normal. Everything, you know? Everything she did. She can do her chores. She wakes up early in the morning. I actually feel very surprised when I look at her now, you know? She wakes up very early in the morning to do a lot of things. She goes to the kitchen and does this and that, you know? And I feel amazed. And I see that she's doing fine. I thank the Lord for that. All for Jesus' name. As a sponsor of the Faith Show, Maria das Graças rejoices when she talks about the blessings and the graces she's been receiving. The graces from, from the sponsorship are many. Um, uh, there is prosperity in my household. And both my sons were often ill in the past, you know, before I became a sponsor of the show. And then after I had been a sponsor for a year or so, they were completely healed. They're both healthy now. After she became a sponsor, thank God, from then on everything has changed. Nowadays, I can do anything I want on my own. Nowadays, thank the Lord God. I can be glad and praise the Lord for what He has done, for God is great. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. But now let's go to the question and answer segment. How can I help someone who has drifted away from the Lord God to come back? How can I help them? Ask the Holy Spirit, for only He knows what that person, uh, what that person needs to hear and how they shall come back to the Lord. He's the only one who can help you. And whatever He teaches you, you should convey that. And with that message, God shall do His work. Now join me in prayer for those who are at home, and we shall intercede for you next. God, we have been hearing great things from you, God. And Lord, we have understood that our coming to your kingdom is not out of the blue. Your mighty hand did the work, your mighty strong hand, Lord, your hard work. But there are people who have very serious problems. God, please deliver these people now. Take away from these lives everything that is of the devil. These people cannot fail, my Lord, or be defeated and become a loser, and they cannot go back. I shall use the authority you have granted me. In the name of the Lord Jesus, be delivered now. Thank you, Lord, and amen.